first question goes like this hmm. consider the following statements about certificate of deposits so this question is about certificate of deposit okay so first uh, first of all to answer this question you should know what is certificate of deposit so we'll see first statement says it is a money market instrument which is issued in a dematerialized form what do you understand by the term dematerialized form that means it is not there in the physical form it is there in electronic form that is what is the meaning of that second statement says it is mainly oriented towards giving greater flex flexibility for investment investors who invest in long term funds so here it is talking about flexibility for investors see uh, upsc and kpsc examination in the preliminary stage the trap will be set at multiple places for example in statement based question you have to underline all those important points where there could be a twist that is something which you have to identify and first you have to underline them while you are answering the question this is a very important thing so where could there be a twist so it is a money market instrument so i don't think the twist would be there it is a money market instrument which is issued in dematerialized form so there could be a twist there whether it is only in dematerialized form or whether it is in materialized form or both such twist could be there second statement says it is mainly oriented towards giving greater flexibility for whom for investors who invest in long term funds okay so i don't think there could be a twist here greater flexibility i don't think that the i mean opposite of that would be greater rigidity i don't think that would be the thing that would be a twist here and next for investors obviously i mean so the name itself says deposit who would deposit an investor would deposit so here it would be for investors and who invest in long term funds here there could be a twist whether are these investors who are investing in certificate of deposit are they investing in long term funds or are they investing in short term funds there could be a twist at this point next securities and exchange board that is sebi issues guidelines for certificate of deposits from time to time is it sebi which issues guidelines for certificate of deposit now if you want to look at the answers uh by elimination method if you want to use eliminate elimination method here uh if you actually know this then certificate of deposit is something which is not issued by sebi but instead it is issued by rbi now since it is issued by rbi you can very easily eliminate option b option c and option d also which will make a one only as the right answer it was a very easy question only if you knew that sebi does not issue guidelines it is the rbi which issues the guidelines okay then second question uh, it is uh, second uh, statement it is uh, oriented towards giving greater flexibility for investors who invest in long term funds this is wrong it is for short term funds consider the following statements about ses so this question is talking about ses in the case of ses the tax payer does not have the right to ask for a reciprocal benefit now what do you mean by reciprocal benefit reciprocal benefit simply means give and take so i pay tax you give me some benefit that is reciprocal uh, what do you say benefit that we are going to ask so we will see that second ses can only be imposed by union government and by the way when there is this two uh, two statement question one or two there is no possibility for elimination here either you should know those statements or you don't know the statement that's it there is no possibility for using elimination technique because elimination technique is possible when there are uh, three or more statements because then you can use the option you can look at the options and somehow arrive at the right answer but here that possibility is ruled out for you so how can you answer this question in the case of ses the taxpayer does not have the right to ask for a reciprocal benefit what do you mean by reciprocal benefit 
Reciprocal benefit means, for example, when it comes to taxation, you can say, I am going to pay this particular tax and I want this particular benefit. But first of all, for any tax, for that matter, forget says, forget, uh, what do you say, uh, surcharge or forget any other regular tax also, there is no question of reciprocal benefit. Yes, you can't say, I am paying income tax and I want this benefit. So you can't do that. So uh, first statement is correct. Second statement says, CES can only be imposed by union government, which is wrong because CES can also be imposed both by union as well as state government. So first statement is correct. Second statement is wrong. And the right answer is A again. Next, which of the following is the definition of effective revenue deficit? Effective revenue deficit. Now, what do you understand by this term, effective revenue deficit? First of all, what is revenue deficit? Revenue deficit is um, whatever the revenue receipts that the government is getting and the difference between the revenue receipts and the revenue expenditure, whatever the expenditure, revenue expenditure that the government is going to make. Now, when I use the term revenue, I'm actually referring to one way flow of, uh, what do you say, money. That is when revenue, when I say revenue receipt, that means government is just getting money there. It is not spending that back. And when I say revenue expenditure, government is just spending the money. There is no question of it getting back, getting that money back. So that is the revenue deficit. But here the question is about effective revenue deficit. Was What does it effective means? See, in case, uh, let's say, Central government is going to give loan to state government. And the state government is actually spending it for some other purpose. Uh, instead of loan, let's say the central government is giving a grant actually. Grant, what is a grant? Difference between a loan and a grant is, let's say you are, go, you are like your friend comes to you and asks you for money. Some, some person who is actually poor, he comes and asks you for money. Like you give him money and you don't expect that money back. Such money is called as grant and you give him money and you giving uh, like you expect the money back after some time period that is called as loan. That is the difference between grant and loan. So here sometimes central government gives grant to the state government and it does not expect that back. It's not going to expect you should give me back on that. So, uh, at that time, the state which is receiving the grant is actually spending it on some capital, uh, what do you say, expenditure, capital assets. So state government is making a capital expenditure, whereas central government is making a revenue expenditure here. There is that difference. But still, you are considering that as capital expenditure and you are going to subtract that from the revenue deficit that gives you effective revenue deficit. So that means difference between the revenue deficit and the grants given for the creation of capital assets. Once again, once again, A is our right answer. Next question. Consider the following statements. <coughs> Final burden of the tax is known as incidence of tax. Initial burden of the tax is known as impact of tax. This is again two statement question. There is nothing much here. If you, you either know this question or don't know this question, that's it. There is no, not much of thinking here involved. So basically, there is a difference. For example, let's say you buy a, a soap or let's say you buy some product, a deodorant or something. So when you're buying that product, actually, there is the tax that you're paying. Yes. There is that tax that you're paying ultimately. But who was the one who actually paid the tax to the government? Now, when you're buying a soap, for let's say the value of soap is 10 rupees. Value of soap is how much? 10 rupees. Out of which GST, let's say, I don't know what is GST for soap, but let's say GST is 2 rupees. Now here, 
you are not actually giving this 2 rupees to the government. Are you like going to the government office and pay 2 rupees tax for uh, the soap? No. When you are buying the soap, at that time itself, tax will be paid. But again, who will ultimately pay the tax to the uh, government? I mean, who will actually initially, who will pay the tax to the government? It will be the manufacturer. Manufacturer, while manufacturing itself, before selling itself, he only would have paid tax to the government. Now, you are basically paying him, isn't it? So here, initial burden, that is, the manufacturer who is uh, including uh, this tax, who is paying the tax to the government, that is called as impact of the tax. And final burden, but uh, like if I say, who actually paid the tax, that would be you, consumer. I paid tax on soap. So that will is called as incidence of tax. Both the statements are correct. So here, C, both 1 and 2 is the right answer. Okay. Next, this is a statement. I mean, this is not a statement-based question, but it is a paragraph question. Let's see. So we, it, we are actually uh, asking a process here. It is a process where government's fiscal health getting improved indicated by reduced fiscal deficit so underline this point what is happening to the fiscal deficit the fiscal deficit is reduced reduced fiscal deficit which is manageable and bearable for the economy improved tax revenue realization and better aligned expenditure are thus components of it so what is that improved tax realized uh, tax revenue realization better aligned expenditure this is something that you should underline so if you look at this look at all these things don't you feel that it is fiscal consolidation now what is what do you mean by fiscal consolidation fiscal consolidation is where government is aware of what is its income and what it is spending simply speaking if you consider people like us common people like us we are aware of how much income that we are receiving and how much we are actually spending. We should make sure that like we, we do not uh, uh, borrow too much, you know. You should only borrow so much which is required. Beyond that, it is always good to stay within your limits. So simply speaking, staying within limits for the government is actually fiscal consolidation. When is, what is fiscal stimulus? Fiscal stimulus is when government is spending, when it is giving extra push. When it, the government is trying to bring the economy up, it is trying to push the economy up, that is fiscal stimulus. During COVID, you know, uh, the central government launched a lot of packages, a lot of packages where it uh, uh, gave a lot of uh, benefits to other people. And it increased the allocation of food grains, it provided incentives to uh, many, uh, what do you say, uh, unskilled laborers, and also it provided uh, direct benefit transfer for a few, few uh, sectors. So here, that is called as fiscal stimulus. And quantitative easing and fiscal stimulus are somewhat similar. Only difference is quantitative easing is done by the central bank and fiscal stimulus is mostly by the government. And there is nothing like qualitative easing. So that was just a point to confuse you people. Next, sixth question. Consider the following about Finance Commission. It is a statutory body constituted under Finance Commission Act of 1949. That is the first statement. The moment you, you get such a question, and if you say that the statutory, it is a, first of all, Finance Commission is not, it is not a statutory body. Forget Finance Commission Act, whatever it is, it is a constitutional body. The moment you come across this, you can easily eliminate that. One is wrong. Any person who has done basic preparation for civil services will say one is wrong. The moment you say one is wrong, irrespective of anything, you have your answer. That's it. Moving on to the next question. The dividend distribution tax is a... Now here, uh, I hope you people... I'm sorry. I hope you people understand what is dividend. What is dividend? For example... Let's say you have a company, you own a company and I buy shares of your company. And when I buy shares of your company, basically I'm trying to, uh, what do you say, share the ownership of your company. 
so your ownership let's say your company is worth 100 crores and you are splitting that 100 crores into some shares and i am buying those shares so for that <clears throat> whatever the profit that your company earns that should be shared with the investors and that is called as dividend sharing of profits with the investors that's called as dividend and dividend distribution tax so first uh, let's see option a tax levied on dividends that a company pays to its shareholders out of its profits so we'll keep that point aside uh, and by the way this is not just dividend this question is about dividend distribution tax this is actually a question about tax what is that tax which is being referred to here dividend distribution tax so <clears throat> In our example, you were the owner of the company and I have subscribed to your shares. And you are paying profits. For, I mean, out of the profit, you are paying me dividends. That is the share in the profit which is called as dividend. Now when I um, get some money in the form of dividend, don't you think that dividend also is supposed to be taxed? Yes, so that is called as dividend distribution tax. So here tax levied on dividends that a company pays to its shareholders out of its profit. That is called as dividend distribution tax. I hope you get it. Uh, so our right answer here would be A. Yeah. Which of the following best defines tax buoyancy? Now what do you understand by the term tax buoyancy? Tax buoyancy, let's say, I'll just give you an example. Let's say a country's economy is growing. When a country's economy is growing, the government <coughs> of that country would expect more taxes from the people. Because the economy is growing, that is, people's income is growing, then the government expects more tax to be collected. Because every country, the government of any country would want more tax. More tax means more power in the hands of the government, more power in the hands of government. It can spend more. By spending more, it can uh, increase the overall political power as well as economic power of the nation. So collecting taxes is very important for the government because if it does not get tax, then it can't spend. When it can't spend, it can't achieve its policy objectives. So for that reason, every government in any country would want more taxes. But how do you measure the appropriate amount of tax uh, with respect to the present level of GDP. So let's say currently India is a 2.5 trillion GDP. India is 2.5 trillion GDP and out of that 2.5 trillion, what is the amount of tax that we are collecting? That is actually tax buoyancy. It is the ratio of the growth in tax revenue to the growth in GDP. Let's say from 2.5 trillion, India is going to become a uh, 3 trillion GDP. So India is growing. India's GDP is growing. But along with that, what is the growth in the tax collected, tax revenue that is collected? So we have to see that, you know, it is a very important measure. So if you take that ratio of uh, uh, growth in tax revenue to the growth in GDP, then we call it as tax buoyancy. Yes. Consider the following statements about statutory liquidity ratio. Now this, I hope you people have read this in your basic books and also was discussed to you in the class about statutory liquidity ratio. So this is some ratio that the banks are um, supposed to maintain certain funds within themselves. Yes. There, is, there are two types of reserve ratios. Which are those two types of reserve ratios? One is CRR, other one is SLR. What is the difference between them? CRR, that is cash reserve ratio, is something that the banks are supposed to keep with the RBI. Banks are supposed to keep with the RBI, cash reserve ratio. Some cash, uh, sorry, some uh, uh, form of uh, liquid assets that the banks are supposed to keep within themselves, that is statutory liquidity ratio. Uh, I hope this is this is already clear to you. Um, so here, let us see. It is the ratio fixed by the government of India in consultation with the RBI. Actually, 
government of india does not bother about banking system much regulation of banking system will be done by rbi so when i say statutory liquidity ratio at least if you know this has something to do with the banking system then you can very easily eliminate first statement but there is a twist here that is ultimately you might get confused here in consultation with the rbi you think the final authority will be the government of india but unfortunately it is not rbi is the one who will decide and that is what is going to fix it is not fixed by government in consultation with rbi so that was a twist which was given to you so first statement is wrong second statement says it is a concept borrowed from usa no this is india's own concept this concept was not borrowed from any other country so here both the statements are wrong which of the following set of figures can be found in the budget presented annually by the government of india see every year the government is going to present budget what are the things that it is going to keep in that budget let's say uh if the budget is presented for the upcoming year i hope you know that budget for example if it is when is budget presented february 2022 then this budget which is there actually is for it will be from april 2022 to march 2023 this will be the uh what do you say year for which the budget will be presented but at the same time what it will do see last year the budget would be presented for this year isn't it so this budget it is presented in february 2022 february 2022 what it is doing it is presenting for next year no so just like that last year this year's budget would be presented what is budget budget is just estimation it is going to predict yeah this is the income and this is the expenditure that i am going to make but uh, um, reality will be different whatever the predictions that we make that will be different from the reality so the present year it is going to present the estimation for the next year so can we find that can we find that budget estimates for the following year so fourth statement is correct because april 2022 to march 2023 we are going to uh, present the estimate estimate means there is no guarantee we are just predicting this is prediction and again in the in the year february 2022 we are going to take that from april 2021 to march 2022 this year this was presented in february 2021 that is the preceding year for this right now we have revised estimates like our prediction was something that last year we had predicted something but by now we actually have revised our estimates that will be revised estimates for the current year that is the year which we are in right now that was february 2022 so don't you think 3 is also there okay now we can take one more thing so for the current year we have just revised the estimates we have, like we, uh, we have got to know the reality and we have revised the estimates then from february 2022 you can do one more thing that is you can take uh, what do you say april 2020 to march 2021 this was presented 2 years before but by now we actually know the exact income and exact expenditure we don't have doubt we don't even have to revise we know exactly how much was the income and how much it was spent so this was for preceding year isn't it so actual figures for preceding year the only thing is actual figures for the current year cannot be produced because budget is presented in february 2022 but the financial year will end in march financial year in, will end in what one more month is there so actual figure for the current year cannot be produced that is the twist here so the right answer would be b 1 3 and 4 2 is wrong